Welcome back into First Draft. It is Thursday, January 18th. I am Field Yates. I have a voice again. And he, of course, ladies and gentlemen, is Mel Kuyper Jr. Mel, how are you? I'm feeling good. I'm glad you're feeling good with that powerful Field Yates voice back where it belongs right here with us. So yeah, it's gonna be fun because we've got a lot of great players to talk about this wide receiver group. You could say historical, I'll go back and look at some years gone by, a, a memorable Chris Berman Boomer uh, take on a wide receiver back in the day. It was one of my, of all the years with Chris Berman at, at the draft field, there was one in particular I'm gonna talk about because it ties into wide receivers. Okay, yeah, so today the theme of the show is of course this wide receiver class, which many who don't have nearly as much experience as Mel does, have said is potentially historic in terms of the talent and how many players may go early in the draft. We'll dive into 10 names of note that might be near the top of the board, plus a couple of players who probably shouldn't be off the radar, Mel, but are a little bit off the radar because of the depth of this class. A reminder, if you're watching us on YouTube, Monday show also available on YouTube. Just go in there, search First Draft. You can find all of our episodes. Mondays and Thursdays also available wherever you get your podcasts. And First Draft is coming to TV soon as well. We'll have some more information when that takes place. But now you just said it. So this wide receiver class reminds you of a certain class. Do you want to dive into that right now or do you want to weave it in once we get to a specific player that we're going to discuss today? Well, I think it ties in because we have Marvin Harrison Jr. Ah, exactly. yes. So it ties ah. into 1996 when Key, and then we work with all these different guys. So Keyshawn Johnson we've all worked with and Key's been a good friend. I remember talking to Key when he was at USC debating about whether he should come out as a junior. He called me. I didn't want to phone. And I said, Key, you know, you're probably going to be in that early to mid first. I said, no, I got to be number one overall. I said, if that's the wow. case, Key go back to USC, and he became the number one pick overall. I said, I don't want to be the third pick, the tenth pick, the second. I want to be the number one guy. So he had a goal in mind. He achieved that goal. He went back to USC for another year. It was in 1996. And then Terry Glenn, we talked about Ohio State. So he had he went number one. Terry Glenn of Ohio State went number seven. And guess what? At number 19. When the Buckeye, it was the Syracuse Orangeman at the side by the name yeah. of Marvin Harrison. Marvin Harrison, I picked the players for the hula ball that year, Field. Okay, as, as my honor, Lenny Kloppis and Marsha Kloppis were running the hula ball. He said, I'm going to pick the players. So I picked the players. Marvin Harrison had a couple of Hall of Famers from that game. Marvin Harrison and yep. Zach Thomas. Zach Thomas, Texas Tech linebacker, fifth round. Unreal. Pick, came to the hula wow. bowl. We were down there. Two coaches that year. My two coaches, Mike Gottfried and Lee Corso. How about that feel? Oh, wow. And, oh, my and gosh. And Ma Ma Marvin was down there. I remember he came in, and he went right to the locker room, grabbed his stuff out of the field. He didn't worry about the cruises. He didn't worry about the beach. He worried about football. And he never yeah. had that game face on all the time. And he went 19th to the Colts. Eric Moulds went to the Buffalo Bills out of Mississippi State. Amani yeah. Toomer, Moussa Mohammed, Bobby Engram in the second round. But I get to the third round. We're doing the draft, right? The Boomer's there. I'm sitting here looking at Boomer. And I knew some of the notes and some of the things he had told me going in, right? There was a wide receiver from out of UT Chattanooga by the name of Terrell Owens, T.O., right? Yeah. Boomer says, hey, I think he's going to go. He's going to go. And he said, I said, uh, don't tell me anymore. I don't want to know anymore because we're in the we're like the late second, third round. And a third round, the pick comes up, and we're doing, a, you know, third round's fast. So the pick comes in, Terrell Owens. And I said, boom, Owens went. You had that. You had it. He said, because we're, you know, it's fast and furious in the third round. It's like, yeah. what's that? I had it. It's, it's, it's like, you know, he's got his pet. He's got his pet. <laughs> Right here, right here. Right he here. had it. He had it, but he didn't use it because it was already <laughs> so he Unbelievable. It. He had it, but he kind of got away from it in the moment, right? Because, you know, things are happening at full speed. He's course, got everybody man. in his ear. He's hosting the show. So Terrell Owens, third round, 89th pick that year. Joe Horn went in the fifth round. Remember Joe Horn? <laughs> Can't say Of course. And our, a good friend of ours, I'll throw his name there. He went, Chris Doran came out that year. Chris Doran from the yes. SEC Network went in the sixth round yeah. that year. But when you look at think about T.O. in the third round, Joe Horn in the fifth, mentioned some of those second rounders, and then you had key number one overall, and then Terry Glenn out of Ohio State, and then Marvin Harrison at 19. Well, guess what? Marvin Harrison Jr. is going to go a lot higher than that. But that draft, all those receivers teams hit on in that draft and became really good, great players. And uh, and there were some steals, and there was a kill, like I say, T.O. out of UT Chattanooga gets into the third round. So, again, this is going to be one of those years where we're going to see guys in the third, fourth round field at wide receiver going to make a big impact in the National Football League. 
No two ways about that. You mentioned some small school stars from that year's draft. The players that we're going to discuss to begin the show today, Mel, is we kind of count down a very, very loose top 10, 10 to 1. These are extremely sub Subject to change, and some of them you and I might not see exactly in the same spots, but mostly big school players. So we'll start here, and no surprise, Mel, at the bottom of this list is in the first wide receiver on your board is Marvin Harrison Jr. So we will work our way to the younger Harrison, but we're going to start, Mel, with Washington wide receiver Jalen Polk. Talked about him a bit after the national championship game. Two Washington wide receivers on this list. If you were to dive in, we'll do this for each prospect, kind of like the strengths and not so much the limitations because these guys are all very highly graded players. What makes Jalen Polk, though, a guy that could go in the first two rounds of the draft? Physicality. I think you look at the way he attacks the football I uh, think in contested situations. A lot of these guys have catch radiuses that are very impressive. Polk, a Texas Tech transfer, comes in, and you got Jalen McMillan, and you have Romo Dunze, but then Jalen McMillan's injured, so they really needed Jalen Polk for Michael Penix Jr. to be a key, uh, yeah, not a go-to guy, because that's Romo Dunze, but to be that second option with Jalen McMillan banged up. And he certainly uh, emerged as a guy that I thought – he, and we talked about this a few weeks. I thought he'd go back. I really did. But obviously, yeah. at that point, we didn't know what Kalen DeBoer was going to be the Alabama head coach, right? You, you figured, okay, Will Rogers is coming in there to be the new quarterback. You know, go back. Well, now we have everything's changing. You know, Washington's losing players. Alabama's losing players. Everybody's losing players now, right, with that change in coaching. But you think about Jalen Polk, I think another year, one more year at, at Washington, with everything being equal, which it's not, and that's obviously one of the reasons why he's coming to the draft, he could have been, I think, a first-round pick. I have right now a, a late second, early third-round grade on him. I didn't see that first round. To me, it didn't scream first round this year. Uh, I think there were some hiccups along the way watching him on tape. But overall, a kid who's got a chance coming out this year, and I want to see how he tests. We don't have – I saw call them computer numbers. We don't have measurables yeah. on these kids. Once the combine takes place, you know, we'll know how fast, how athletic they are in comparison to other players. And also going back into history, I always go back in time and look at where guys historically stacked up against this year's class. But for me, late first, uh, late second, early third, some think higher. Field, I know you're higher on Polk than I am. Where do you have them right now on your board? I think there's a case right now, Mel. There is a case that any of the 10 wide receivers that we're going to discuss right now, with things going correctly – over the next three months, as we're now less than 100 days from the 2024 NFL draft's beginning, any of them could go in the first round. Ten are not going to go in the first round. Maybe five, six, seven at the absolute extreme. But with good testing, a good pro day, some of these guys, there are some medical concerns because of things that took place either this past season or seasons prior. If those things check out, there's a plausible path for any of these guys to go in the first round. The big question, the big limitation, though, for someone like Jalen Polk to prevent him from going in the first round, Mal, is that I think he's a good athlete. I don't think he's an elite athlete, right? The suddenness does not jump off the page here. The vertical speed does not jump off the page here as it does some of the other players who have a comparable build that we'll talk about in just a little bit. I like to think of wide receivers and their superpowers. What is the thing, the one thing they do at an extremely high level? And you mentioned the physicality for Jalen Polk. I'll throw one more trade into the mix is we all, for good reason, love watching catches like the Odell Beckham Jr. three finger falling backwards into the end zone catch that lives on SportsCenter top plays for a decade. Those catches matter. But I also like the guys that just consistently make catches in their catch radius, right? Anything at their body, within their arms, reach is going to be caught. That, to me, feels like one of the strengths of Jalen Polk is a lot of contested catches, a lot of throws over the middle, a lot of throws into tight windows, a lot of throws that maybe for a different receiver are in completions wind up in his mitts. He's got very strong hands, which gives me some confidence that even if he isn't quite as sudden as some of the guys that we're going to talk about in just a little bit, can be a number two wide receiver with all things going right in the NFL. That's number 10. Number nine, Mel, and again, these are all very much subject to change, but just to give people a reference of kind of where we're at with some of these players, is Lad McConkie from Georgia. Uh, he had uh, an injury-impacted season, Mel, but when he came back from that tightrope's uh, ankle surgery, he's, he's had multiple things over the past couple of years. But uh, when he's come back from injury, Mel, I thought to myself, this does not look like a player who's been dealing with what I thought was a fairly significant injury. What's the outlook here on Lad McConkie? I'll tell you what, uh, you talk about attacking football with great hands and polish, and I'll tell you, he's fast. 
He can run. Fast. And uh, Aladdin McConkey to me, you mentioned the durability concern. He had that injury. He had the back. Remember, he missed the first three games with the back injury. Wasn't 100%. He had about 58 catches and, well, you know, about, uh, you know, in that uh, 22 season, 2022 season. But, uh, you yeah, know, average with 13 yards a catch with seven touchdowns this year. Obviously injured, doesn't have the production. But when he's out there, that, that was a different offense. And he played, of course, with Stetson Bennett and with Carson Beck. But I think the fact that when you look at him, when he's at full strength, the damage he can do after the catch, the uh, you know, about suddenness and quickness out of your break, he has that. Uh, I'm a big Ladd McConkey fan, which is going to be around 5'11", 5'11 and a half, 185. Uh, but I'll tell you, with the pads on, he is a tough matchup. Uh, he's a very, very deceptive football player when you watch him play. I mean, this kid, I, I know there's 40 times going to be field. That's why it's going to be fun to see at the Combine Pro Day what he runs. I think he has a chance to be at worst, at worst, a mid-second round pick. Um, you know, I look at Ladd McConkey, had he been healthy all year for Carson Beck, who had a whale of a season taking over for Stetson Bennett. Maybe we would have been looking at the late first round as a possibility, uh, but he didn't have that year with the injury, uh, injuries, I should say. Uh, but I think when you get a guy who's NFL ready, talk about yep. ready to contribute right away as a rookie, he is uh, with the way he runs his routes, how he sets up defenders, how he has pace to his routes. Uh, love the kid. And I think, like I said, you get him in the second round. I can go back to the history. I talked about some of the guys over the second round period over the years we can get into. But he's going to be one of those guys say, well, why did he go in the first? I think we're going to be saying yeah. that about Ladd McConkey after he has a great start to his NFL career this coming season. Totally agree, Mel. Here's part of the reason why I didn't have him higher in this sort of artificial wide receiver board is the NFL defaults to bigger, faster, stronger guys, right? Bigger and stronger is not going to apply to Ladd McConkey vis-a-vis a guy like Adonai Mitchell or Brian Thomas Jr., who are just bigger. And in the case of Thomas Jr., uh, maybe faster, uh, maybe stronger in the case of A.D. Mitchell. I guarantee you, though, that Ladd McConkey is going to be the player. The team's picking in the back end of the first round who have a wide receiver need, but they have a quarterback who's ready to help them win right now. Like, just start to rattle off teams. Houston, I think, could use a little bit more depth at wide receiver beyond Tank Dell and Nico Collins. Cleveland, beyond Amari Cooper, could use a little bit more wide receiver help, right? The Kansas City Chiefs, we've talked about them all year with their wide receivers. The Buffalo Bills, Stephon Diggs having a diminished impact during the last 11 games. He has yet to go over or has failed to go over 100 receiving yards. These teams who are ready to win right now, as a matter of fact, one of those three in the AFC could very well be in the Super Bowl, unless it's your Baltimore Ravens. Uh, one of them will be in the Super Bowl and still have a wide receiver need. Those are the kind of teams that I think of with Ladd McConkey because I don't think four threes is off the table for Ladd in the 40 at the combine. I think high four threes is possible. And if he runs a four three eight mil, we're going to be talking about him as a back end of the first round guy. Hey, exactly. I'm going to be doing my first mock draft of the year, mock 1.0 on Tuesday, and he's borderline for me, Field. Uh, you, know, you know, you say, okay, how's he going to ta- – I, I look at this kid and say, what's he lacking? I mean, he's going to come into this league, and he's going to be a really good player. So, he, yep. to me, could be a possibility when we get into that late. First, you rattled off some of the teams, Field, and you're accurate on that. They could strongly look at, at Ladd McConkey If he does test that well, when you get into – do you want to add McConkey? Do you want to add an eye mission? Do you want to add McConkey as an Xavier worthy out of Texas? Yeah, so yeah. there's going to be some guys in that discussion uh, that are going to be, uh, you know, guys that I might shade Vlad McConkey a little bit. So by the time we get to that mock first, I'll figure it out on Sunday. But you're right. He's a, he's a really good player. Like I say, he's going to have an impact as a rookie. Yeah, and if you need it right away, that's the thing. It's just, if, you, if you need it right away, Vlad McConkey is going to give it to you right away. He's got an NFL ready skill set and he's going to absolutely fly if he does run at the combine all right next up is a player that really burst onto the scene this year mel and i already have fear that i'm going to be too low uh when doing mock drafts or he's going to go too low in the draft process in three years from now we're going to be saying how do we let this one slip through the cracks and xavier leggett uh one of two xaviers we'll discuss uh from south carolina who had just a monster 2023 season mel a guy who prior to that had been okay He's an impact player in the return game. He's an unbelievable athlete. Feels like the ceiling is very high from the get. Yeah, you mentioned the improvement and then the production increase. He was a great kick returner field. That's where he made his mark in 2022. Average with 29 plus per return. Uh, it was a South Carolina game top school record, I believe, at that particular yeah. point. Yeah, he was 10th on their team and receiving yards, okay? Uh, yeah, he had 18 catches. And then you say, okay, going into the year, was he even on our top 20 receiver list? No. Right. Okay. And all of a sudden, this year with Spencer Rattler, you see him becoming – I remember he was a quarterback his senior in high school. 
had played a lot of basketball and baseball, multi-talented athlete, get all that big kid power forward at about 6'3", 225, 228 in that area. This year, he got off to that great start through the first six games. He had 37 catches for a 19-4 average and three touchdowns. He was on my radar. He was in that top 25 mix field. I said, boy, this guy, you talk about going back to Alshon Jeffrey, an old South Carolina game top. That's who he screamed to me, Alshon Jeffrey. Uh, sure. You know, the size, the speed. I mean, he's deceptive there. The big plays in the vertical passing game underneath with his run after catch ability. He another one. He high points the ball. I love that aspect yeah. of his game. In tight coverage, he is a nightmare. He becomes that power forward getting that rebound, right? So in the production increase from 18 catches to 71, from 9.3 a catch to 17.7 a catch, from three touchdowns to seven catches. Now, it was one year. You wish it was two, but it was only one year field. But in this one year, Xavier Leggett significantly improved from maybe a fourth, fifth round guy to a guy that could be in the late first, second round, certainly no later than round two. Yeah, he is such a great athlete. You mentioned it. The high pointing is so impressive. I thought that one game, and I try not to overweight one game all that often, but I've referenced it a couple times already on the show. But anytime a player performs well against the Georgia defense, it catches my attention, right? Because that's the closest that a college player will have to playing against an NFL defense, at least amongst the SEC teams, right? The entire Georgia secondary, most of the front seven, the linebacker, you know, they're all get drafted, right? These guys are all excellent, excellent players, and they're extremely well coached. And Leggett kind of had his moments against that Georgia defense where he looked like the superlative athlete on the field. And he actually had a couple of instances where, like, He's so athletic that he might poorly time a jump and still levitate for long enough to come down with the football because he's just that hyper athletic. So uh, I can imagine him right now, Mel, not just hurting a team down the field, but wide receiver screens like that kind of stuff would scare me having to defend Xavier Leggett with a wide receiver screen when you've got a 220 pound guy running probably a four or five at the worst. And with that kind of power. And because he's a kick returner, he has the vision and the elusiveness too. He's going to be an impact player. Again, another guy that I just fear I'm going to be way too low on because I think he's got the chance to be a star at the next level. Uh, next to your Mel, another Xavier, very different style of player. That's Xavier Worthy from Texas, who uh, really good football player, Mel. But if he decides to pivot from football to track, we might see him in Paris at the Olympics this year because this kid might be the fastest player in the entire draft. Yeah, I love guys like this because I remember having conversations with NFL personnel guys and GMs and saying, boy, it's a space game. I heard that years ago, and it's, it's become that. Again, with the bubble yep. screens and the quick passes, and everybody wanting to get the ball out of their hands fast and short passes, it becomes an extension to your running game. I get all that. Xavier Worthy's that kind of guy. I go back to, like, Safe Flowers. Love Safe Flowers. I see a little bit of that in Xavier Worthy. Hollywood Brown, those kinds of space guys is what you're looking at with Xavier Worthy. And I'll tell you what really impresses me with this kid. Steve Sarkeesian said last year, and this is the one thing that frustrates the heck out of me, field, is college, college football programs in general, all of them, they're not going to tell us what the injury is. The guy's hurt. It's a lower bot. He's, yeah. They never want to disclose what the injury, why, I don't know, but they, they better start, okay? Start doing it this year. Give us the injury. Let us know what it is. Brian Kelly just spoke Yeah, it's good for the kids. Brian, 100%. But he had a broken hand two years ago. And I was watching Xavier Worthy, second half scene, he's dropping balls. You know, he just wasn't consistent, but he played through a broken hand which we found out about leading into this year when Sark said, hey, give this kid credit. He's team first. He's got incredible character. He's not a, a selfish kid. Give me the ball. He is a guy who just wants the team to do great. He'll do whatever he can to contribute lightning quick and super fast, as you said. It's a difference. Some guys are straight line. Yeah. So he's fast and quick. Uh, he eliminated a lot of the – he had a drop every now and then, but eliminated all that for the most part this year. He can return punts. He's dynamic as a punt returner. And don't to kick returns don't usually matter, but now because it's kick returns have been eliminated basically with the rules. But punt returns do matter, and he can be electrifying and dynamic in that way in flip field position. Uh, I think for me, top 25 borderline, he's been in there a lot for me. I've always had him between 18 to 25, 18 and 30. I think he's a first rounder. I don't know yet whether mid first, late first field, but it's hard to overlook him in round one. Yeah, just to give people some perspective, like having a guy seventh or eighth on our wide receiver board might still result in a first round grade. That's just how deep this class is, Mel. I've already made him a two-sport two star as 
a football player and a potential track athlete, the four by 100 this year in Paris, I'm going to give him a third sport. I think if you're Baltimore Orioles, who, I mean, there are all kinds of loaders. They don't need anybody else, Mel. But if they ever needed a rangy center fielder, Xavier Worthy also would fit the bill because some of his deep ball tracking, that's special, right? And, uh, you know, when you're throwing these vertical shots down the sideline, there's a lot less room to work with. But when you're beating defenders cleanly with your speed down the middle of the field, quarterbacks are just doing area throws, right? Just throw it that way, right? Throw it towards the post, throw it towards the flag, whatever it might be. And his ability to run underneath some of the deep throws from Quinn Ewers and obviously other quarterbacks at Texas when Quinn was out uh, for a portion of this season really set out to me as well. It's one thing to be fast and get behind the defense, another to be able to actually punish them once you are behind them and sort of in that center field mold. Uh, So Xavier Worthy, one of definitely two maybe three Texas wide receivers along with Jordan Whittington who might get drafted this year. But right ahead of Xavier Worthy is his other teammate, A.D. Adonai Mitchell, who uh, came on the scene this year with Texas, had a breakout season in terms of catches, yards, and touchdowns. Mel, what do you like about the former Georgia standout as well? Yeah, I'll go just to go back to that. When you mentioned center field, Baltimore Rose, I got to mention Paul Blair. Paul Blair, the great Paul Blair. Yeah, what a of course, he would yeah. like, show shallow and hit your track him, you know, uh, 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 fly ball as well as anybody. And, uh, and like I say, played shallow, so like cut off a lot of base hits because he was, his line drives, he would get. So you say center field, Baltimore Rose, screen Paul Blair. Yep. But in terms that of kind of <laughs> Adnai Mitchell, you know, when he saw him at Georgia, it was two years ago, I remember saying, boy, this kid's going to be really good. And it's, you say, leave Georgia to go to Texas after, you know, 2022 didn't go the way at hope. But this year, he at 6'3", 6'4", 195, you talk about these guys who just had the length and the athleticism and you throw it up. That's why it was frustrating as well, watching Texas get to the 12-yard line and you're throwing a little little swing pass out to the running back on first down. When you got A.D. and uh, and I Mitchell and you got Xavier Worthy, you got Tavion Sanders, the tight end, who's going to be in that mix to be the tight end two this year. Um, Didn't make a lot of sense. It cost them a play, and they luckily got the fourth down play, but it didn't matter. They they were able to hold them off. Uh, But in terms of Adonai Mitchell, the mismatch problems he creates field are there. They're real. Uh, The big playability he has, certainly this year, he averaged over 15 yards a catch with 11 touchdowns, and he had the the big one in that game as well. Uh, You know, you think about where we are with these receivers and and in terms of just not space, but red zone. And being able to convert red zone opportunities in the NFL field, not field goals, but touchdowns. We see all these coaches now. What are they doing? Analytics comes into play. Let's go for it. Let's not, I know early in the game, get the seven, not the three. But at any moment, these guys are going to say, no three, we want seven. When you have an ad nine Mitchell field and you're a quarterback and you have a chance in the red zone to up, he's going to be a rough matchup for cornerbacks in the National Football League. Yeah, and, and the Alabama game, which, of course, took place early in the season, he had an, a touchdown in which he just kind of left Kool-Aid McKinstry, kind of stuck in his tracks there early in the game, and that, of course, contributed to Texas's win. Last thing I'll say about A.D. Mitchell, Mel, is he can run a route. I mean, at that size, it's not like you have to be this pristine route runner because you're just bigger than most defensive backs are going to be manning up on you. But the fact that he's as silky smooth as a route runner as he is at that size – Super impressive. He's got some big game medal as well. He had four touchdowns uh, in college football playoff games. Like this guy brought it when the lights were brightest. I think he may have transferred. And I kind of think this was something he talked about a little bit. A transfer to Texas might have been in in part motivated by wanting to be closer to where he's from. I think he's from Houston. So that might have been part of it, Mel. Uh, But it worked out for him in the very end, going from one superpower program to another He's a first round, uh, excuse me, a potential first round pick. He's a college football national champion during his time with the Bulldogs and uh, now going to be a very, very, very important player for some team. Excuse me. Next up on our list here, Mel, is the other LSU wide receiver, Brian Thomas Jr. What does he bring to the table for the Tigers? I'll tell you what, uh, the size, the length, the big playability, and a guy to really feel when you watch them this year, you go into the season saying, yeah, it's going to be Malik Neighbors, and Jake Daniels is going to be going to Malik, and you know, who's going to be the two? Is Brian Thomas Jr. He became the guy. And uh, you think about the improvement he showed. I, I just throw numbers out at you. I mean, the big jump in production. Two years yeah. combined, he had it went 59 catches, two years combined going into this year. And then this year he's got 68. His average 17 plus a catch. He had 17 touchdowns, led the nation. 
the yep. improvement was dramatic field. And, and when you go two years combined, they're really overdoing that in one year, passing that in one season as the other guy to Malik neighbors. And when you're six, four, you're 200 pounds, go back to the Florida game, the old miss game. It was the Wisconsin bowl game, the, but the Florida state early Arkansas, Wisconsin, like I said, the combination of length, speed, you mentioned tracking the football. He does that very well in the deep throws. He does need a little more polish. I think another year would have benefited him, but he's obviously he's, he's out here. Here he is as a first rounder. He will need to be coached up. There's wide receiver coaches in this league field. We'll be loving working with Brian Thomas Jr. Um, the body control as well he has. Um, you think, you know, you think about where we are right now in terms of comparisons and stuff. We we have we have already seen. When we just already talked about these receivers, you know, these six foot plus, six three, six four, long, athletic, catch radius through the roof. I mean, the numbers, the strength in numbers at wide receiver, not diminutive dynamos. These aren't diminutive yeah. dynamos. These are the yeah. real big, you know, angular. Some of these guys are, need to put a little weight, and we'll get to one probably during the course of, of today's podcast. But when you really look at it right now, he's one of many. <clears throat> I right now have a, I put him ahead of Keon Coleman on my board. So he's ahead of wow, Keon okay. Coleman. I have him around 15, 16 on the top 25 big board. I think he screams to me mid first round. Now, is there a little concern because, like, there's not the polish you see with some of the other guys? Yes. But with the talent and the production and the ability to take a top off a of defense that he has, I see, I see Brian Thomas Jr. going in the mid first round. I thought the bowl game against Wisconsin was actually important for Brian Thomas Jr. for this reason, Mel. If there was a knock on him prior to that, it was, is this player for now a one-trick pony? And that one trick, by the way, is super dangerous because I thought, I still think, the best vertical threat amongst all these wide receivers. Like, he's got this second gear that he hits. Once he can get on top of a defensive back's feet, once he can narrow that gap, when that cushion has been narrowed, all of a sudden, it's like, he presses his foot onto the accelerator and he's gone because no defensive back. I mean, very few of them can keep up with him in terms of pure straight line speed. And Jaden Daniels, one of the best deep throwers in all of college football this past season. So it was a perfect marriage between these two. But that bowl game, eight catches, 98 yards, two touchdowns. Great production, but different type of production, right? It wasn't just, it wasn't, you know, five catches for 177 yards and two touchdowns. It was more volume more underneath stuff. But even if that element of his game, a short to intermediate receiver is not available right away, he's just too good vertically. I mean, he's going to change how defenses can approach an offense every single snap that he is on the field. You know, there are players that we see in the NFL right now who kind of are designed to just run deep and influence the defense. And it doesn't necessarily have that great effect, right? Like, Marquez Valdez-Scantling for the Chiefs is pretty much out there to run wind sprints and try to open things up in the middle of the field for the rest of the offense for the Chiefs. It ain't working, obviously, right? He hasn't had a lot of production. Brian Thomas Jr. is the kind of guy that if you ignore him, then he will have maybe not 17 receiving touchdowns in a single season, Mel, but he might get 10 in a hurry because uh, his speed is the real deal. And if you pair him up with a strong-arm quarterback, watch out because uh, he can get behind anybody. That speed is is legit. Six to 496 pounds, so we'll see – how fast he runs, but it'll be fast. That much is for sure. Yep. When you're even, you're leaving, right? And that's what he does. Yep. That's right. <clears throat> and uh, next up is Keon Coleman, the aforementioned from Florida State Mail. 50 catches this year, 11 touchdowns. Over 20% of his catches went for a touchdown this year. A guy who I think you could see go really high, but might be a little bit lower in the eyes of some. You mentioned you've got him behind Brian Thomas Jr., but what does he bring to the team? Tell you what, he is super smooth, super athletic. He's 6'3", he's 210 pounds. Was at Michigan State where he had 58 catches for a 14-yard average and seven touchdowns in 2022. Goes to Florida State, and I had people in the league tell me in July, August, watch out for this kid. And even in going into September, based on what they saw in August, that this kid's going to be spectacular. And then you watched him in the first game against LSU, and he was phenomenal in that game. Uh, you know, had nine receptions and three touchdowns. Then you said, okay, let's see this guy become a, there was talk, because I remember thinking about where I'm going to put him, to put him around five, six, seven, eight, on the big board and think he's going to be a top 10 pick in the first round. Then yeah. you have Jordan Travis at quarterback, right? You got Johnny Wilson as well at wide receiver making plays. They had a couple drops, but he was kind of became the go-to guy as well. You had Benson running the football, this dynamic Florida State offense that was in a lot of games unstoppable. Keon Coleman 
in six games field had three or fewer receptions. And yeah. I kept waiting. I kept saying, why aren't you getting him the ball more? Why is he more effective? I saw a drop or two as well with Keon Coleman. But for a kid this dynamic, that he expected to see a little bit more in some games where he was a little quiet, ended up with 50 catches for a 13-plus average and 11 touchdowns. But there was – the body control with, with him is outstanding as well. But the lows, the lows in some games where he went and was quiet. He wasn't really taking over. So out of those games, you could see Jordan Travis's eyes went to Johnny Wilson. That is something I factored in when you start slotting receivers a little bit. So for Keon, heck of a year, great talent. He's going to test really well. Uh, but it's got to eliminate some of the costly drops here and there. I think all concentration drops eliminate that and then become a guy who can take over games maybe on a more consistent basis. And we saw at Florida State when he had a couple wow games, but he had some games where, like I said, he was a little bit more quiet than you would think for a kid with this enormous talent level. Uh, we should start some sort of uh, like drinking game for the viewers and listeners. Every time that I mentioned that Keon Coleman was a basketball player at Michigan State during his freshman season there, they should take a drink because it's going to be a lot over the next three months your mill. But it's important to me because you do see that, right? You see a player who you talked about the body control in the red zone. I don't know how many receivers in this draft I'd rather throw a fade to than Keon Coleman. He's going to jump over you know, any defensive player that's trying to hold up against him one-on-one. -on -one. He is a terrific touchdown maker. I mentioned 11 of his 50 catches went for scores this year. So over 20% of his total catches found the end zone. The biggest question mark, it would appear for Keon Coleman that he has to answer during the pre-draft process beyond the production is how fast is his fast? Is this a four, five, seven guy? Is it a four, four, seven guy? Is it a low four, fours guy? If he's low four, fours, then we're probably talking about a top half of the first round pick. If it's more like low five, low four, fives, mid four, fives, Mel, then I think it's a different conversation that could influence guys like Brian Thomas Jr. as an example, potentially going a little bit higher than Keon Coleman. Love watching him, though. Florida State was such a defensive team that this year I do wonder if some of the production might just be because they overwhelmed you and they had a great rushing game with Trey Benson. Uh, but Coleman has a lot to bring to the table. Not yeah. too far behind. Go ahead, Mel. Yeah, one point about that, you mentioned speed. Yeah, it's, and that's the hard thing to really factor in is the speed, the athleticism, the combination of both. And do we downgrade a guy if he doesn't run great? Do we elevate a guy who runs that phenomenal 40? And is that, is that the separation? Sometimes it gets you in trouble field if you rely too heavily on that. I go back and you try to learn from past drafts. In 1985, Jerry Rice came out of Mississippi Valley State. Caught, caught a yeah. ton of balls, right, at a lower level of competition. Al Toon came out of Wisconsin, big body, great athlete, yep. out high catch radius and all that. Eddie Brown came out of Miami where he was doing everything down there in that pro-style offense for the Hurricanes. Al Toon went 10th overall to the Jets. Eddie Brown went 13th to the Bengals. And Jerry Rice, Rice went 16th. Jerry Rice didn't have – he was, what, 4 5, five four, six coming out. Yeah. yeah, he didn't have that blazing 40. He was coming out of Mississippi Valley State. Remember early on at San Francisco, he had some drops. He was dropping some balls. Remember in training camp, they were a little worried. Then you see this Hall of Famer emerge where he's the best in the business because he was so disciplined, so consistent, great route runner, great knowledge of what he was doing. And, you know, he didn't need to run a 4-4. Four -four. There were some guys that run, come out from a couple of Tennessee guys came out years ago. That, you know, they were straight line. They didn't have the burst out of their break. They couldn't pace their routes. Uh, and they were undisciplined route runners. So, to me yeah. – Speed is important. It can separate, but you got to really be careful. And I go back, like I say, Jerry Rice, the third receiver taken. And we talk about historic years. There's Al Toon, Eddie Brown, Jerry Rice. And here's that, you know, Jerry Rice, the third of that group taken, 16th overall, becomes a Hall of Famer and one of the best ever. So, and, and like I said, his 40 time, I remember Emmett Smith running back. What did Emmett run? Four, five, eight? So yeah. running backs, we talked about. Remember Curtis Dickey came out of Texas A&M, ran incredible, right? And he was, but he was straight line. So, yeah. again, you want wiggle. You want the ability to make people miss. There's a lot of factors more so than straight line speed. So, we, I think we got to put that all in perspective at combine time. But certainly for these receivers, it's going to be interesting how we – how do we factor it in? Do we move a guy up a little based on a 40? Do we move a guy down a little if he doesn't run as well? And is that ultimately going to matter once they're in the NFL field? So, that's why scouting, <laughs> evaluating, and putting them stacking your board is very, very difficult. It's all part of the process. That much is for sure. It's one element, but it is a key element in the eyes of some. The final three wide receivers, Mel, I don't think the time's going to matter because these guys are just too good. Order very much in fluctuation, as we keep saying. But we'll mention Roma Dunze first. I know 
You know, he's your second wide receiver, Mel. I mean, we're talking about a player that's part of the Nick <clears throat> nine. We need another sort of subcategory for these three wide receivers, the big three, whatever you want to call them, the three musketeers, the dynamic trio, you name it. Because these, th- these three wide receivers, Mel, if they're still available after the first 10 picks of the draft, absent something wild, injury or something like that taking place between now and April 25th, I'd be stunned. Stunned. Roma Dunze up first. This guy could be a top five pick. I would say right now there's no possible way any of those top three receivers got out of the top ten field. I don't see. agree because you have I the Jets. I believe the Jets are at ten, and that would be as far as you could see a receiver. And I, I call Brock Bowers a receiving entity because Brock Bowers from Georgia would certainly be in that mix. Tight end who's going to go in the top ten overall. The Jets certainly need offensive line help and wide receiver help. Somebody opposite Garrett Wilson, so it would make sense if a receiver was there, they would take him. It would certainly make sense if an offensive lineman that they have a high grade on is there and they they take him. But to the point about Rome, Rome. This year, what really stuck out with me, Jalen McMillan hurt, Dev Polk, but he's their go-to guy. And nobody, where I remember I said Keon Coleman was quiet in some games, there were some lulls. There were no lulls with Rome. Rome didn't have a low game field. I mean, if you look at every game, over 82 yards in all but one game, that was five for 64 against Arizona. Five receptions or more in all but one game. Yep. That was a Mr. three reception, 111 yard, two touchdown performance against Arizona. It was a, the a game against Utah. There was the game where he didn't have the, all that, all those receptions. He had three for 111 and two touchdowns against Utah. And we're talking about that one a while. That was still a really good game. But over 82 receiving yards in all but one game. The fact that he had 92 catches for an 18-yard average and 13 touchdowns, up from what he had done the previous year when he was really good with 75 for a 15-3 and 7 touchdowns. That, to me, not one year, but two years of a body of work. Every game, he was difference a difference maker. Every game, okay? Yep. And he's, he got his weight up to about 215 from where it was as a junior. He makes the difficult catch. The catch at some drop, he makes look routine. Yeah. You talk about who's smooth. There's not I many smoother than Romo Dunes. Ed. Uh, he is going to be, and I know I, I remember reading what Jalen McMillan was saying back in August. He's going to be a freakish talent. I mean, when he gets sure. test, I don't know what he's going to work, what his numbers are going to be, but 50 50 situations, speed down the field, deceptive in terms of cornerbacks not realizing you know, how fast he really is. I thought about when you're even, you're leaving. That's Romo Dunes as well. I just love the kid, mm-hmm. I love everything about him. You know, will he be the second receiver taken? Maybe not. Will he be a Pro Bowl caliber receiver in the NFL? Yes, he will. So it feels like that, that kind of has the tenor right there of being your guy. You know, every year you have a guy and, you know, you, you you planted your flag early on Zay Flowers last year. You and Todd, Todd, Todd actually both tried to do so, but uh, you end up getting the edge. And mm-hmm. he's now a Baltimore Raven. So it feels like, you know, that's really one that you get to almost have like a double victory for. Yeah. But if Roma Dunze is potentially your guy, Malik Neighbors might end up being my guy, Mel, because, I mean, for everything that we have talked about with Roma Dunze that I agree with, I'm still having a hard time not having Malik Neighbors as maybe one of the five or six best players in the entire draft. Talk about explosive. This guy is as explosive as any player at any position in the entire draft. And we saw it this year. And, yes, he had a terrific quarterback who can throw the deep ball as well as anybody in the entire class of Jaden Daniels. But the number of times that – Malik well, Neighbors is just leaving defenders like 20 yards behind him. Think about that Luke Musgrave catch for the Packers against the Cowboys this past weekend, which like either it was a coverage bust or it was just like a, a total schematic master stroke by the, the Packers. Something like 18 yards of separation. I feel like I was watching LSU tape because that's what they do all the time, right? These two wide receivers are just 50 yards down the field with no DBs even on the screen. But beyond the vertical speed that Malik Neighbors brings to the table and the explosiveness, what I think is really cool about his skill set is that I think he is going to make life incredibly difficult for teams that try to play zone against an offense in which Malik Neighbors is one of the top two wide receivers. His instincts, and that's something you have to do on occasion when you're playing a player like Jaden Daniels, because if you play man-to-man coverage, you leave yourself very vulnerable to the quarterback run. We saw that a ton this year, a lot of zone coverage against LSU, and his ability to just kind of sit, plant where he needs to plant, and then once he catches the football mill, no wasted movements. Up the field, uh, a seven-yard button hook turns into a 17-yard gain because he's good after the catch. He's decisive. And while he's not a huge guy, not super powerful, this isn't some kind of guy, Mel, where 
you breathe on him, and he falls over as well. So enough run-after catchability to pair with the incredible explosiveness and route running that Malik Neighbors, to me, if he went fifth overall to the Chargers, I'd say nice job to whoever the future Chargers DM is because as of right now, there still is no Chargers DM. Yeah, you make a great point, Field, about you know who's your guy. He yep. could be my guy. I haven't decided yet Neighbors or Odunze it too. I'm not going to box myself into that corner. Uh, you know, it really is a case where go back to 88 with Timmy Brown. Tim Brown went sixth overall out of Notre Dame, Heisman Trophy winner to the Raiders. Sterling Sharp, great player, South Carolina, went to the Green Bay Packers at seventh, great NFL career. Yep. 11, Michael Irvin, playmaker, went to the Dallas Cowboys at pick 11. So we had six, seven, and 11. I mean, think about that Tim Brown, Sterling Sharp, and Michael Irvin. Okay, that's an 88. 85, we had Al Toon, Eddie Brown, Jerry Rice. In 896, we had Key, Keyshawn Johnson, Gary Glenn, Marvin yep. Harrison Jr. I mentioned Terrell Owens in the third round. So, you know, you talk about these, these, these elite. We have Marvin Harrison Jr., then Romo Dunze, or Malik Neighbors, right? So it's three. Then there's a little drop-off, just a little drop-off down to the next group, right? Which is Brian Thomas Jr., Keon Coleman, Xavier Worthy, Adam, Adam I Mitchell. But I think the top three are right at the, up there, top ten. Yep. So you're looking at three that compared to me, like Tim Brown, Sterling Sharp, Michael Irvin, Al Toon, Eddie Brown, Jerry Rice. And like I said, I think the point being, we, we're not going to sit here and say we love one guy, but we, we're we okay with it. I think we're going to really, really like all three, which we know we do. I have not yet decided on na- neighbors to me this year. He wasn't that guy last year. This year he right. was that Break guy. Season. And that's why I say Jaden was there, but Jaden became that guy. Jaden was a fourth rounder going into this year. All these guys improved dramatically in the field. Yeah. Jaden took his game to the elite level. Brian Thomas Jr. did it in this year what he couldn't do in two years, surpassed that. Neighbors, think about this 72 catches, love that. But 14 yard average, he's up to 89 catches for almost 18 yards. So he goes from 14 to almost 18 per catch. He goes from three touchdowns to what? 14? Are you kidding? I mean, that's amazing improvement, dramatic improvement to become that guy, field. And to me, what also screams second receiver at worst third, and it's going to be right there with, with Doug Dunze, they're basically equal, is in nine games, 35 yards or more in terms of reception. So in nine games, he had a catch of 35 wow. or more yards. Field, that's Big amazing. Play. And then Amazing, you think yeah. about, he had a stretch of five games with a catch of 45 yards or more. And in his last five games with Jaden Daniels, he had a catch of 45 or more yards. Huh. Yeah. I, that's, and, and what I love too, you've got versatility field. You can yeah. put him outside. Great. The slot. Great. Then I heard him say this. I'm a Louisiana guy. They were talking about Jaden Daniels and you know, his toughness. He said, I told Jaden when he got here from Arizona State, you're in Louisiana. You're in the state of Louisiana now. I said, oh, yeah. Louisiana guys, you know, we play through ankle injury. We play through pain. We, This kid, neighbor, Malik Neighbors, he's a baller. And he's he a is. guy you want on your side. When you're getting into that that game day and it's 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 a war out there and you gotta, you're fighting and you're to try to win that football game, this is a guy you want on your side. So I have not yet decided by wide receiver two, wide receiver three. It's Odunze neighbors. Love them both. But the you talk about and Booger McFarlane, LSU grad, right? Yep. Booger's favorite word is what? What's his favorite word? Physicality, right? Physicality. Sure. Yep. Elite neighbors, tough as nails. Uh, and uh, these all guys all had quarterback. He had Jay, Marvin had CJ Stroud, and then McCord. You think about Odunze had Michael Penix Jr. Brian Thomas had had the, the quarterback. You know, the, the Texas kids had uh, Ewers. Um, you know, Leggett had Rattler. McConkie had yes, Carson. Yeah. And it, they all had received the quarterbacks to get them the ball. But I think when you look at Malik Neighbors' field, you mentioned that 200-pound frame. I just love his attitude. The talent, the attitude, the improvement in terms of overall big play production. Uh, he will not have to wait long to hear his name called in late April in, in round one of the draft. We can put a pin on the wide receivers here, Mel, and I think one of us can – I'll let you handle it here. And we don't even really need to say a whole lot about Marvin Harrison Jr. because we've talked about him so much. So maybe the question is not, like, what does he do well? Because I think people are probably aware of that. But just thinking historically, and your Rolodex is bigger than anybody's, when was the last time you think we had this much anticipation about a wide receiver as we do Marvin Harrison Jr.? Are we talking 10 years ago, 5, 2? What kind of class are we discussing? I think you're talking about Megatron, Calvin Johnson. 
I think you're talking wow. about a guy that, you know, when you talk about he won't have as high a grade as Calvin Johnson did coming out of the collegiate ranks out of Georgia Tech, but he's certainly going to have an elite grade. Uh, you could make an argument he's the best player in this draft. He's my number two player on the big board behind Caleb Williams, quarterback USC. The thing that I think you have to look at is this. What happens when he's on the field as opposed to when he was off? I go to one game. I tried to bring it up with quarterbacks when they're not there, and it doesn't matter when you're an elite team. But when you're when you're a receiver on an elite team, and that team has a 35 to 24 lead, which became a 38 to 24 lead when he's hit by Bullard in the end zone. Javon Bullard hit him and caused that concussion. There was no flag thrown, but he never played again in the fourth quarter. It was the end of the third quarter, about 35 seconds left when he was injured. That game became 38 24 Ohio State with a quarter to go. That quarter did not involve Marvin Harrison Jr. in that semifinal game two years ago, correct? And look yeah. what happened. Ohio State lost that football game with C.J. Stroud, a quarterback, believe it was 42-41. They missed a field goal, about a 49-50 yarder late. Could have won it when Stroud got him down the field to put him in a position to try a, a potential game-winning field goal that they didn't get. But if Marvin Harrison Jr. plays that entire game field, Ohio State's moving on to the national championship game playing TCU and probably winning a national title, right? Yeah. He's Injury that prevented him from playing in the fourth quarter of that game, in my opinion, prevented Ohio State from winning the national title. Winning that game, wow. winning the national title. That's the difference that Marvin Harrison Jr. makes. Uh, he's another one talking about consistency week in and week out. Um, dynamic performer. Yes, he would have a drop every now and then. They all do, right? They all, do. Yeah. They all have that. But uh, to me, you know, you could make a strong argument when he was with DJ Stroud in 77 for a 16 4 yards and 14 touchdowns, right? He gets Kyle McCord, he still has 14. That's 28 touchdowns, 14 to 14 the last two years. His average per catch went up from 16 4 to 18 1 from Stroud to McCord. He went from 77 down to 67 catches. But hey, what did he not do? What is he, what in your opinion, field is he lacking to be saying he's either the best player in this draft or at worst the second best player in the draft like I have him right now? Oh, I was going to say, if, if it was the best player in the draft discussion, it would be that he doesn't play quarterback and quarterbacks make the most money and their impact is the greatest of any on the entire field. Um, but Mel, I would say this, if you're finding issues with Marvin Harrison's game, it's like going to a beauty contest looking for a pimple, right? It's like, you know, you're, you're just searching, you're doing your best to find something that is like probably not really an issue. I mean, it's, it's incredibly smooth. I, I don't know what he'll run speed wise at the combine, but I don't think I care. I don't think I care either, right? Like if he does run, by the way, because whether he like you know Xavier Worthy, you can tell is like track speed fast. Even if Marvin Harrison Jr. doesn't necessarily look as fast as Xavier Worthy does on the field, it never impacts him, right? Like speed was never an issue for him. His body control down the field, his speed down the field, his physicality. He glides as a route runner, makes catches that he really shouldn't. And I, you mentioned he did have good quarterback play, especially in 2022, but it was down this year, right? Like Kyle McCord, obviously, there's a reason why he is no longer the Ohio State starter. He's now at Syracuse, where he'll be a good player for our producer, Jackson Nagello's Orangeman there. Um, but this was a year in which I thought that Marvin Harrison Jr.'s skill set, I don't know if it shined more than without C.J. Stroud, but it shined in a different way, which I thought was important. It kind of put an emphatic stamp on him being the number one wide receiver in a class that might be, might be the best that we have seen in whatever that is, 92. It was 32 years ago, the last time we – or 96, I'm sorry. So 28 years since we had a class that maybe stacks up to this one. Yeah, now I think – And Field, also one thing too, when you talk about 96, when his dad, Marvin Harrison Sr., went 19th overall. Marvin Harrison, Hall of Famer, great player, 5'11 and a half, 181 when he came out of Syracuse. Yeah. Different, okay. right? Marvin Harrison Jr., about 6'3", 6'4", with 205, 210, whatever he'll be. He won't be as fast as his dad. But he's much bigger, and and yeah. and both have one thing in common. I said this to we Dar Marvin Harrison Jr. came on the Darian Bell show about a month ago. I don't ah. have him on. And it was Saturday great. morning on ESPN Radio. Yeah. Oh yeah, Saturday morning. We're ten to one now Eastern time every Saturday. Ten to one Eastern. Darian Bell, ESPN Radio on Saturday mornings. But when Marvin Harrison Jr. came on, I said, Marvin, I was with your dad, and that that business like approach. And I said, I see it with you. I don't see a lot of smiles. I, you know, you're you're all serious about your work, and he said, Yeah. Well, was ingrained from day one uh and that you see the same ability you see the same mindset one to the other it's amazing and hopefully he has the equally as good as careers as dad did who was unbelievable in the nfl so uh we've seen a lot of that over the years I, i'm gonna be i'm gonna be looking at 
third generation players. I've been staying his business long enough field, but to, to be there with Marvin Harrison and at the Hula Bowl in '96, and then to see Marvin Harrison Jr. now be a high first round pick in 2000 in the 2024 draft, it, it's great to see. And uh, you root for kids like this, and it's great. To, I, I just you wish he wouldn't have been hurt because I really think that George. And you don't know for sure. I shouldn't say right. definite. I just think. Had he played There's that, a chance. they're up 38-24, Field. They're up 38-24. Yeah. And he sure. had not played in the fourth quarter. With C.J. Stroud, a quarterback, I'll take my chances with Marvin Harrison Jr. in the fourth quarter against against uh, against uh, Georgia in that game to, to hold one and win that football game. So, But injuries are part of it. I get it. Everybody has them. Unfortunately for Ohio yeah. State, they had one with him. But I think when you look at the, the mocks that we're going to do, Arizona's picking four. If Arizona yeah. gets Marvin That's Harrison at four, be very happy, kid. Yeah. Uh, I should have said this at the beginning of the show, Mel. If you are a super fan of a player at a program that we did not talk about, if you are the agent for a player that we did not discussed today, if you are a person who just follows the draft ardently, and we didn't mention your favorite wide receiver today, we're sorry. That's how deep this class hey, is. Hey, I got to jump in. Person. You know, can I jump in here? Yeah, please. I, I love a player we didn't discuss. And I know people say, where the heck is Malachi Quarterly? I'm know. a big Malachi Corley fan. Yeah. I mean, he, he, he could be like Debo Samuel type, Malachi Corley, Western Kentucky, Troy Franklin, talking about taking the top off of defense, angular yeah. receiver out of Oregon, Tez Walker, Kent State to North Carolina. There, we, we didn't get into Tez. We didn't get into, into Troy Franklin or, or Malachi Corley, but they're right there. To me, when you talk about top 10 receivers field in this draft, Corley, Walker, and Franklin are all right in that mix. Every time I turn on the tape for a new wide receiver, Mel, I keep thinking to myself, this class is crazy, crazy deep. So deep that we're going to do more talk on wide receivers on future editions of First Draft. But in the meantime, we're back on Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern time. If you want to watch us on YouTube, you can do so live during the Monday shows. Thursday editions will be posted to either YouTube or wherever you get your uh, various podcasts, whatever platforms that might be. He's Mel Kuyper Jr. The man knows more about wide receivers than anybody does anything else in the entire world. Mel, enjoy the divisional round weekend. Uh, the first game for your Baltimore Ravens in the playoffs should be a good test on, on Saturday night. We'll discuss that and so much more on Monday. Until then, we'll talk to you all soon.